Good evening and welcome. I'm Ari Weitz. I'm part of the Temple Emanuel Stryker Center staff. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, we're so thankful for those of you who can make it in person and for everyone joining us on the live stream. Before we get to tonight's guests, I would like to mention some upcoming programs. On November 16th, we will host the Feeding the Will to Endure. It's in partnership with the Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial Foundation. We'll be joined by four Holocaust survivors to discuss the cookbook, Honey Cakes and Latkes, recipes which survivors clung to, cooked after their liberation, and passed on to their children. For a full list of upcoming programs, including an evening with Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, as well as Jerry Seinfeld in conversation with Jim's Ga James, Jim Gaffigan, and the Orchestra of St. Luke's 50th Concert at Temple Emanuel, please visit stryker.nyc. Tonight we have James Beard award-winning chef Michael W. Twitty here to discuss his latest release, Kosher Soul, uh, both a love letter to being black and Jewish, as well as a collection of black Jewish fusion, fusion recipes. Chef Twitty will be in conversation with James Beard award-nominated writer Gabriella Gershenson, who you might know as our resident food expert or from her many published works. If you're watching at home and have any questions, you could submit them to questions at emmanuelstrikernyc.org. And if you're here with us tonight, we'll walk around with a microphone. And now, please welcome Michael and Gabriella. Good 
Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Michael, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to set myself up and say uh, virtual audience, welcome, and thank you for being here as well. Um, I've been doing a lot of homework on you, Michael. <laughs> you have so many videos. You've been so prolific with your writing and with your demonstrations of the cuisine of your multiple heritages. And tonight, you know, we are um, celebrating the publication of Kosher Soul and um, the event of being able to talk to you about it in this synagogue on this day. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it because as the audience probably knows, you contain multitudes and there's going to be a lot to talk about. Um, so I'm just going to start by reading a very brief but pointed passage uh, from your book. Um, the book, just to set the stage, is about many things, but ostensibly it's really about um, your embodiment of African American and um, black identity and your Jewish identity and how you've combined them. And, but that's not it. There's more, but that's just the, the very, very basics. Um, and you talk about uh, commonality between black and Jewish people. And you right here, my greatest hope comes from the ingredients that blacks and Jews bring to the table. I am the first to admit we are an incredibly exhausting set of people. We talk about the food we had before and the food we're going to eat next while eating the meal at hand. <laughs> we beg of our loved ones to partake in food as if we actually need to eat our oppression. Our stereotypical foods have become shorthand for inside jokes we tell almost definitely at the deepest hatreds facing us. We sprinkle on our food traditions, sarcasm and irony. Still, there is a lot of memory in our heads and on our tables, lots of love from parent to child, sighs of security when we realize our menus translate our means of survival across millennia. I wrote that. <laughs> you wrote that, yeah. Wow, wow. Give it a try. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's like this. Jews, eat this, it's terrible. <laughs> Why do I want to eat it? It's, te it's terrible, trust me, it's awful. Black people, you gotta eat this, this is nasty. Mm. <laughs> it's like, you have to eat your oppression, you have to eat, oh my God. And I, and I realized that really late too, it was like, we're the only people, I, I grew up in a very multicultural community outside of Washington, D.C. So I had a lot of Chinese American friends a lot of Korean American friends. You know, these are cultures that are really ancient. A lot of Salvadorian, Mexican American, Puerto Rican friends. Ancient based, food based cultures that are very deeply in love with their food. But there is not the same relationship with food. You know, yes, they have, they're, they're like smaller diasporas and many exiles, but it's not the same thing. I'd love to talk to you about that. You made me think of um, something you said in High on the Hog, which I don't know if anyone here has seen the Netflix series, uh, High on the Hog, in which you appear. Um, and you said to the host, uh, Stephen Satterfield, that soul food is the only cuisine that has been named for something intangible, that has been named, I think you said, like for spirituality and love. Right. Um, and I, I'd love to talk to you more a bit about that. And also, you know, in this book, you talk so much about how you and other black Jews have created cuisines that combine your identities that are completely black or African American and completely Jewish, but also, you know, they're, 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 individually those things and, and both. And I wonder if right. you feel that there is that same idea 
of a soul cuisine in both traditions. Absolutely. And of course, you know, I call my own cooking Afro Ashkafardi. Because all elements of all the above. You know, um, the first thing is that people have the mistaken idea that, and I hate this, I hate this to, the, to my bone. But you see this, the parallel in Jewish, in, especially in Ashkenazi Jewish cooking. Okay, so soul food, it's the scraps. Sure, it tastes good, but it's always fried and healthy. And that's why those blacks have such poor health. My grandfather lived to be 99 on the, ver on, the, on, the, on the verge of 100 when he passed. He ate roasted sweet potatoes from the ground, fish from the mill pond, corn from the field, collard greens from the garden. My granddaddy was 94, 95 when he was still chopping down wood and harvesting peaches from his own tree. That agrarian lifestyle, that natural lifestyle that, gave, that brought all that food to the table, kept him and my grandmother and my step-grandmother alive. My step-grandmother lived to be 101. My, 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 grand, my father's mother, 95. My granddaddy, 99. These are the black folks who did not leave the, leave the South, did not leave those traditions. They weren't up here in the North having to depend upon the corner store and the bodega, living in food deserts. You feel me? They weren't, in the, they weren't in the generation that said, oh, I'm not country, I can go to the grocery store. Not knowing that the grocery store, that convenience food was killing you. So, you know, I live with the, the dregs of both of those realities. But, you know, I changed it to Ashkenazi food. Y'all know that some of that stuff that we, we have that's like, sorry, man, at Shepherds and Straits, not the greatest. <laughs> check out that sodium sometime. Check out, you know, check out the trans fat sometime. Because we're, because we're obviously, for some of us, the, the, the main value is kashrut. Sometimes in, in having that value, it means twice the salt and half the flavor. But also people go, oh, the food's so gray and brown. You know, um, I don't know if Jeff, Jeffrey is here this evening. Yeah. But I mean, hey, but I mean, like, uh, I can't see a thing, brother. Um, but I mean, the kind of work that him and Liz have done, Liz Alpern have done. I, I'm just going to introduce them. Yes. Uh, Jeffrey Oskowitz and Liz Alpern from Gefilteria, yes. who are bright young people who have helped revive and bring honor back to the Ashkenazi Jewish food tradition and reminded people that it came from, like you were describing of your grandparents, like a, a, a very, you know, seasonal, fresh place and then in our culture has become very much packaged foods and we're, you know, Jeffrey and Liz have done a lot to take that back. So please carry on. I mean, it's, it's, the, <clears throat> it's the fruit <clears throat> that became, you know, um, what am I thinking of? It's, um, what is the, okay, my, I'm doing have a run of brain right now. It's all right. What is the, um, the okay, uh, not, the word Shabbat comes to mind, but that's, that's Middle Eastern. Compote. When you're harvesting, when you're harvesting the, fruit, the fruits of your very short summer, and they go into the winter. When you, you know, I remember reading um, There Once Was a World, and she describes the gardens in Asia Stock, in Lithuania. They, these were not like three crop gardens. So in the book, Kosher Soul, I have actual African-American, Ashkenazi, and Sephardi Mizrahi gardens. Mm -hmm. Because I want people to realize we're an agrarian people. That's ultimately the, the root of the best of our true traditions, um, but spiritually, and you know, it's the root of our, our ethics. Mm -hmm. But it's also the root of the diversity of our table. But of course, you couldn't, I mean, when you hear the kind of like horror stories of the tenement life, like people raising geese in basements, and you know, people who had, uh, uh, you know, Italians who had like the one hog in the, in the patio out back. I mean, it was really, you know, just trying to, trying to cram in that old country life into the most densely populated space on the planet Earth at its time. It's almost impossible. But you know, our, but the thing about it is, is that there's a lot of misogyny in that food hatred. A lot of this, there is, because guess what? It was the mamas, it was the aunties, it was the bubbies, it was grandmama and them 
that kept, not only kept you alive, but kept, kept you endeared to your culture. Mm -hmm. And so the, re the result, the, the reaction against that was to condemn it mm -hmm. without actually looking at nutrition, health, balance, et cetera. Uh, when you talk about the agrarian roots of, bless you, Thank you. Um, you know, that Jewish people share and that black population shares, I'm interested to hear more because I know that my experience as a Jewish person, the more I learned about the Jewish holidays, the more I really understood that they're tied to the rhythms of nature. Right. And the foods we eat on those holidays follow suit. Um, so in your writing, in your book, did you find that there was a commonality in the rhythms of celebration and food in the cultures that you identify with? So I became friends with Shani Mink the Jewish Farmer Network, she's one of the founders. And Shani's incredible because, you know, she has her own outlier status as a woman. Um, I never forget the story she told me that I put in the book about how because she was doing something with Pearlstone in Baltimore. And she, there was a group of, you know, um, black hat folks who came to, to um, glean. And the little boy who was very urban and very focused on what he saw on the page says, why is this girl, who he, who he probably assumed was not Jewish because she wasn't dressed, she wasn't, she's wearing pants. Why is this girl, excuse me, this woman, talking about Maser, talking about separating tithes? What, what is it, what's it to her? And, and that's keeping some of the harvest for yes. the poor. Yes, yeah. and then of course you have talk, talk, her talking about Maser, but she's also in a space where where he's also in a space where that, shouldn't that apply to the land of Israel? Not necessarily to, you know, you know, Pikesville or Park Heights in Baltimore, which are very, you know, urban enclaves of from Jews. And, you know, we talked about how for her it was, Jews don't belong on farms. Jews are doctors and lawyers. Why do you want to be on a farm? Or you're going backwards. Um, versus African Americans. Why do I want to go garden? Why don't I be on a farm? I ain't no slave. It didn't come from the kids. It came from my parents' generation. Okay? Some of whom went to the farm during the summertime. We didn't, black people didn't have camp. The rich black folks had camp. The rest of us had going down south. They put you on a train, on a Jim Crow train. You got off the train. And my father, of blessed memory's case, your, your grandfather met you there with a mule a mule wagon. Ida and Henry were the, na the names of the mules. And you went home to work on the tobacco farm. In my grandfather's case, the cotton field. You know? Well, Daddy, I remember Daddy always told me, he said, that his father um, learned, taught him how to plow cotton by putting his overalls on the edge of the plow. He said, you're going to learn how to plow this, plow, plow this field straight. I mean, that was a real thing up, up to my parents' generation. And for me, for, for those of us, like Jeffrey and myself, different parts of, of our generations, to recapture the kind of things that a lot of people just said, chuck it. We don't want this anymore. It's too much work. It's too tiring. Who cares? Move forward. Why are you wasting your time with the past? Just go for it in the future. What future did we have? Everybody in this audience knows the American, the American uh, food system is uh, fakakta. But there, what, what, what's, what's, the, what's the antidote? Going back into this tradition, which has lasted longer than anything else we've ever known. In the case of Jews, 3,500, 4,000 years. In the case of people of West African descent, 10 to 70,000 years. You know, black eyed peas, 10,000 years old. African rice, 5,000 years old. Cattle, 8,000 years old. You know, we're ancient people. Do we, really, do we really believe that we're so smart? That we can outthink our ancestors who live generation, 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 and got us here on this stage? So that's how, that's how I look at it. And so Shani and I had these conversations when we met lo a long time ago, and I duplicated them in the book. So we had a long, we had, we were, oh, this was you know, during COVID. So we had to do this over Zoom and by phone. And we were really so energized to, to remember that we're doing this reparative work. You know, food isn't just, you know, how do you make this, what's your technique, what's the recipe? Let me tell you all my, my technique. 
I put it in a cast iron pot of cooking and it's done. That's my technique. I ain't got no sous vide machine at home. I got none of that nonsense. The sous vide machine. Has for shalom. I do want to ask you something. I, um, this is kind of a tangent, but you made me think sure. of it with the, um, the cast iron pot. So you do some very beautiful like uh, live fire cooking mm -hmm. with your cast iron pot because you do a lot of recreation of recipes. At Colonial Williamsburg and like historic sites which address the, the heritage and history and story of enslavement and free people of color in the 18th and 19th centuries. That's the other half of my life. The colonial clothes, the 19th century clothes, cooking over open fires on the open hearth. I am not a reenactor, thank you very much. I am a living history professional. I'm a 21st century person. If you come at me with that, what year is it? I'm gonna remind you in different ways it's 2022. <laughs> Y'all got that meaning when I said that, right? Mm-hmm, so try to be cute. This is, okay, 21st century historical food historian, really. Um, but this is a, the, the uniquely Jewish question. I have no problem with the fact that you're, you cook with lard in those recreations. Yeah, what am I supposed to cook with Colonial Williamsburg? It's like, they didn't have, they didn't have Crisco. But it's really interesting to me because, you know, I've seen you demonstrate these really wonderful recipes with lard, which is I don't have a problem with. However, you know, it's not kosher. But in Kosher Soul, you talk about so many interesting recipes of your own right. where you substitute in different foods because you're not eating pork. And I'm really curious about those, that duality of you know, advocating for lard in your historic work mm -hmm. when you're tapping into the African-American history. But then in this book, I mean, really, we have some very creative workarounds from, with not right. eating pork in this book. So how do you kind of reconcile those two things? I think things? the first problem is that a lot of people come to Southern food and to African-American food in particular. You know, there is, for example, there is an African-American path to veganism than is everybody else. And there's a lot of cultural and social media conflict over that. Because for a lot of white folks, veganism is about you know, um, security and safety for animals and animal welfare. For black people, it's definitely about health and self-improvement and self-awareness. And for us, those adjustments actually all come out of religious movements or philosophies. So what came out of the Nation of Islam, what came out of Sunni Islam, what came out of Buddhism, um, what came out of African traditional religion and African fo African American forms of Judaism, etc., and also Christian movements like Seventh Day Adventist, Jehovah's Witness, all of them had dietary changes and issues. The biggest culprit was pork, because if you go to West Africa, I've been eight times. There, pork is not the most common thing. So pork is pork. Pork to us, I go, jokingly say, pork is. Um, a H, a, sorry, A M, after Massa. We we weren't a pork eating people, and pork doesn't even show up in the African American dietary structure until the late eight, the middle to the late eighteenth to the nineteenth century. It's not one of our staple foods historically, and as a as a window, do you know why? because animals were used to, to enforce colonization. Cattle and hogs roamed the South, wreaking havoc on Native American communities. That was on purpose. That was not, that was not a mistake, that was on purpose. And they understood these animals also spread disease and destroyed Native crops and also if the English rule was, English and Anglo-American culture was, if the animals extend their range, I can put my fence wherever the animals are, and I can crouch on your land. So that's another element here. I'm not denying that pork is a really important part of the deep southern diet, especially the deep southern black diet. I'm just saying that it doesn't have the prominence and importance that I think non-black people think it does. And furthermore, a lot of us have been smoked turkey for a while in terms of our, because it's very, it's important, um, one element that's important to talk about with the food is the umami element of smoked and preserved fish or meat. In West Africa, it's predominantly fish and some, and some meat. In um, the Caribbean, um, you often have cow foot, 
You know, it's like in Nigeria, cowfoot too. In the south, pig's feet was, took the place. But also, these foods were not available all year round. Let's make this also clear. You did not get chitlins and pig's feet and everything all year round. You only got them when? When you slaughtered an animal. When would you do that without refrigeration? The dead of winter. You know how hard it is to get the dead of winter in Georgia? So, so the idea that we were eating these foods all the time, out of season, and couldn't get enough of it is complete nonsense. Perfectly uh, uh, not, not true. It's almost, as, it's, a, it's, it's, it's par the parallel in, in Jewish food history is the idea that, that Moses ate latkes. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> I'm, you see, it's the assumption that nothing ever changes. That Judea, that, that, sorry, Okay, so first of all, let me just say this. When I say Judaism, I do not mean the religion. I mean Judaism is the, is the religious civilization of the Jewish people, because Jewish people takes priority over the rest of it. So it's, it's this idea that, you know, Moshe never saw a black hat. Moshe Rabbeinu never saw a kippah. Moshe Rabbeinu never saw a laka. And by the way, when we say lakas, we're talking about something that both came from an Italian heritage and from Eastern European heritage. The word is blini. So blenses, blini, probably original lacas. And then, after the time of Frederick the Great in the 1770s, we have the potato, which led to a population explosion, which also led to an anti Semitic backlash. So, knowing your food history and knowing how you're rooted in food and the stories about food is really critical to understanding who you are. It's, really, it's a really deep part of the process. Like, I didn't, I didn't get this until I held in my hands the lumper potato that was the source potato for the Irish potato famine. So innocuous. And yet, because it was so easy, it was so much easier for them to constantly plan and, re and copy the genetic nature of this potato, when it got one blight, everybody starved. And that caused a mass excess around the planet Earth. So it's, so it's so critical to sort of understand how these mythologies we tell about ourselves through food mm -hmm. and these truths we need to learn can affect our worldview on what it means to be black or African American and Jewish or whatever. Let's talk about that. Um, you, there's a master class, if you all are familiar with master class, the online learning platform. You're teaching one on tracing your heritage through food. Mm -hmm. And you said something um, that I found very, very memorable. Um, I watched your, your master class synopsis. And uh, you said, being willing to confront the good and the bad that your ancestors, ancestors endured is a crucial part of tracing your heritage through mm -hmm. food and being able to confront the trauma, which I really resonated with me. Um, I think anyone who has written and tried to write honestly about food understands that it can be scary if the story of your family or your roots are actually, you know, <clears throat> if it's a, a traumatic story, not all joy. Right. But I, I would like to ask you this question, though, Michael. I, and, I, and I can't help but think about this in the context of, you know, there have been a lot of, um, just a lot of, painful events for our country in terms of um, anti-black violence and anti-Semitic violence. And today is, I can't believe it's the fourth anniversary, but it is the fourth anniversary of the Tree of Life shooting. Wow. Um, and wow. I, but I, one thing that I hear um, from, you know, the, the monolithic voice of the Jewish community and, you know, social media or whatever it is, is that there's always a reminder of the joy that we take in, in our identity. So I want to ask you a question. Just, you know, bear with me here. But we're talking about confronting the good and the bad that your ancestors endured. And just off the top of your head, I would love for you to share with us um, a story of your food heritage that is the good, that brings you joy. Do you really? Hmm. <laughs> My great, great, great grandmother drowned the overseer on her plantation right after the Civil War in a vat of cane syrup. I'm so proud of her. And she never faced retribution for it because he was an alcoholic. Literally, she was, he was going to beat her. She said, no, you not. Not today. 
Took him, took him in, took, he took her in the cellar. Next thing you know, he was face down in a vat of cane syrup. And that's, where he, that's how he died, with a nostril full of molasses. That's the, that's, you know what? You know what that brings me joy? Number one, they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. <laughs> Number two, um, we're not supposed to like that, right? We shall, no, we not today. We gonna overcome by putting your white supremacists behind took us in some molasses. <laughs> and you gonna see the devil this, the t in about five seconds. Was, was that story passed down yes, through the absolutely. generations of your family? Yes, yes, that was passed down. And it reminds me that food is also resistance. Resistance in our choices, how we choose to purchase, how we choose to help our neighbors be nourished. I mean, I, have, I have, now have a group of, a wide group of friends and acquaintances, one woman I know, um, does strictly African-American, um, sorry, black women's um, postpartum diet and health. Because so, you know, people don't realize, so many of us are adversely affected by you know, um, you know, issues with childbirth and child rearing. Infant mortality is very high. And post-birth mortality and depression and health issues are very high. So it's so critical to, to understand Food is resistance. You know, the very act, the very act of eating matzah is one of the oldest forms of resistance through food we've ever had, right? We're, you know, we could have some lovely sourdough bread, but instead we have this unleavened bread. We've been complaining about this unleavened cracker for 3,500 years, which is very Jewish. <laughs> But you know, that's what it takes, that's what it takes. And I'm not kidding about that story. That story, I told the story on Poppy Tuker's uh, show, Louisiana Eats. I'm sure the audience was like, oh. But why not? Why can't we, why, I'm so sorry. Why can't we be happy when people who wanna destroy us don't have the luxury of doing so? And I might also mention, do you really think he, can't, he brought her in that basement, that cellar, just to have physical violence, if you know what I mean? against her. So she was a, that was a two for one. But it gives me pride because I know that I come from people who just didn't take it. They always resisted, they always fought back. And by the way, the women in my family in particular didn't take no mess. That was the main message my mom gave me. She said, when I told her, I said, your maternal ancestors were Mende from Sierra Leone. We're the same people who turned the Amistad around. She said, I know because I don't come from people who just take whatever. I come from women that fight back, come from men that fight back. That's what I want you to be. That's how I raised you. And that's who I am. And of course, being Jewish has, has buffered that with the idea of, of social justice and moral suasion. You know, when I hear social justice being, being uh, lambasted in our culture, I know what that means. That means stop that Jewish stuff. Stop that eight day, stop that eight hour day. Stop that, you know, take a day off of work for Shabbat, a weekend. It means stop that, save the orphan and the widow. Do not oppress the deaf. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's, that's social justice. It, that, and that's, that, that is the fiber and being of our food culture. You really get down to it. So yeah, that's what makes me proud. It's not some story about some lovely meal with greens and collards and, and chicken and whatnot. It's a woman who said, no, not today. I, I, I don't mean to bring something up lighthearted in juxtaposition with this very powerful story, but you did- a lighthearted story. It's a, okay, good. Well, let's, you know, we'll laugh about it. Um, <laughs> but you reminded me of something very funny that you said that I'd love, uh, for, I don't know, to share with the audience about, you mentioned matzah, and um, you said, this is an interview that I read that you did, where you mentioned that, you know, sorry, um, Earl of Sandwich, but it was Hillel who uh, created the sandwich because the first historic mention of the sandwich is the Hillel sandwich. Would you like to tell us what the Hillel sandwich is? So, it, originally, it wasn't that craziness we call some, some, some gold horse radish. Y'all know what I'm talking about, the purple one. And, or if you're hardcore, the freshly shaved horse radish, not as fun. And of course, the haroset, and then you got the 
two pieces of matzah. Originally it's a lamb, the bitter herbs, and the matzah. And of course, um, my favorite, one of my favorite Jewish chefs, Michael Solomonov says, we Jews invent the sandwich because we ain't got time. And I just thought, <laughs> perfectly said, you know, we're, we're people on the run, people on the move. Um, it's definitely a food of, of migration people, you know. Um, and it's, it's that kind of awareness. You know, fish and chips, Jewish. I used to think Linzer Tort was Jewish, but Joe Nathan told me Linzer Tort isn't Jewish, but I like to, uh, I like to claim that it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's just, it's just this idea that these, the tomato in Italy, Jewish, right? The, the idea here is that these oppressed and marginalized people, the victims of the original sins of the West, anti-blackness, anti-Semitism, have been responsible for much of the modern world, the Atlantic world, the Western world, the modern world's approach to and access to food. It's because it's not, it's not the, it's the, the main power players who are doing the moving. I mean, the British, God bless them, um, they didn't, they weren't really running that show when it comes to tea and spices and then curry here or, or that there. It was the people that, that they oppressed and marginalized that did that and made those things. So to the point where, you know, the national food of Britain, you know, mm -hmm. isn't, necessarily, it's, it's the fish and chips of the Jews, and it's, um, I'm having another run a moment this, today, but you're taking my vitamins. Um, what's the, 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 tikka masala, thank you. Wow, but, we have a clairvoyant in the you, audience. Yes, <laughs> tikka masala, which of course is a British version and Scottish version of a, a bastardization of the, of the Indian food, but it's still based on Indian subcontinent cooking. So in the same way in America, the, the, the most authentic American cuisine, because of indigenous people and African people, is Southern food. Southern food is about the Bubba's, not the brothers. It's about the brothers, not the Bubba's. Although if you watch TV, it's all about the Bubba's and never the brothers. And other food is about the Bubbies. Yes, <laughs> and, the, and of course, yes. Our, our other food is about the Bubbies. So if you don't have the brothers and the Bubbies, you ain't got no American food. Um, in that interview about where you mentioned the Hillel sandwich, the interviewer said to you, well, you know, the, the, the French and the British are going to be really angry with you for, for claiming that Jews created the, the sandwich. And you said, stay mad. you said, well, we gave them foie gras and fish and chips, so they should be happy. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. But it's this idea, this erasure of people um, from the common history that is so ridiculously sad. Because what it does is, it, it's, it's another way of saying to the everyday person who, doesn't, who is not us, right? That we're marginal, we're supplementary, we're secondary. And that just isn't, that just isn't the case. I think these, these stories just amplify the fact that we have been really critical to the culture. Let's, let's talk a little more about that. Um, you know, I, we talked earlier and I mentioned to you that I always knew the term diaspora because that's the term that as a Hebrew school going Jewish person, you know, I was, I understood where, you know, Jews in the diaspora mm -hmm. are living outside of our country of origin, you know. And that was my understanding of the word diaspora. Much later, I caught on to the fact that Diaspora is a quintessential term to describe the migration of African people from their home countries. And I think that I imagine so much just dynamism that you're describing, commonality between the Jewish and African American cultures that you're describing. It is very much a product of two ancient diasporic peoples. Right. And I'd love to talk to you a little more about that in the context of food and also in the context of what you were just talking about. Like, you know, um, because we're nomadic, because we are forced to move from place to place, usually because of persecution uh, or threat of persecution, um, there is that notion of not belonging. Mm -hmm. There is a real you know, very 
it's very easy to scapegoat someone who just showed up, right? right. Um, so I, I, I would love to just hear your thoughts about how that affects um, the cuisine of a group of people through right. your, your studying and your observations. So you, you, you have to figure out what tells our story. It's like I talk about in terms of African-American, Afro-Caribbean, Afro-Latin culture. We all have okra. Okra is indigenous to Africa. Um, and that okra, was so, so the, you can imagine these women sitting around a plantation in Jamaica or Virginia or South Carolina or Brazil, even Veracruz, Mexico. All these places have an okra soup. All you needed was okra, some kind of protein, um, other vegetables like onion, tomato, hot pepper. How is it? This is a miracle, right? Not only do we all, do we all use the same word to describe ourselves. Nashao, nation, nation, nation. That, that word comes up in every part of the African Atlantic world in whatever language we were forced to adapt. The word nation. We figured out we were a nation within a nation, a people sovereign into ourselves, because we didn't have any official status with the law except as chattel. So to, for us to assume ourselves as a nation and as human beings was our first act of resistance. And then these women are sitting around going, okay, okay, so I'm gonna use the modern terms of the countries, I'm not gonna use the historic terms. I'm from Senegal, you're from Angola, you're from Ghana, you're from Nigeria. How are we gonna teach our kids about an Africa they've never been to? How are we gonna remind them they are different from them? How are we gonna remind them that these are the, this is how we eat? So every one of these places developed their own okra soup. Some people called it gumbo. Some people called it okra soup. It took different forms, but it's the same basic principle. You know, you have, in, in Judea, Jewish life, Jewish peoplehood, the question becomes, what, so what unifies all these different Jewish diaspora cuisines? Kashri is one example, mm -hmm. but also the observance of Shabbat and holidays. Another, another element, of course, is um, the interplay between the food of the country mm -hmm. and these two elements, but also it's not always the laws and customs. Sometimes it's flavor preferences. <laughs> you know, it was just like, in, like, for example, in Morocco, where lamb might be used, Beef was preferred. There might be a little more sugar in the food, in Moroccan Jewish food, than in the majority. Same thing in Poland. We always found a way to kind of like distinguish between the foods of the community and the foods of the host culture. That interplay is very important. And it's, it's also done just to sort of like say, um, kind of like you, but I ain't you. There's, there's something very powerful about that. So for me, it's like looking at, you know, asking ourselves, what, we ask people the question, all right, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna, let's do a little activity, shall we? I want you to yell out so we can't hear you otherwise. What, when I say a Jewish home smells like? Kasha. <laughs> chicken, kasha. Chicken fat. chicken fat, right, onion. Brisket. Brisket, right? <laughs> Garlic. Garlic, yes. So, and, 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 and wine, right? And so there's this, there's this and cinnamon. So don't forget cinnamon. Because you know, all of y'all got like eight boxes of cinnamon in your, in your pantry. Because you forgot about it, you keep buying it. <laughs> the next time, let's buy some more cinnamon. When I, when, those of us who know the African Atlantic tradition, when I, was, when I was doing the master class, I asked people on Twitter, what is the black kitchen? And it was a golden moment because everybody was chiming in. Afro, you know, black Puerto Rican folk, Afro-Mexican folk, African-American folk. And it was funny because it was the Tenement Museum a few weeks, like last week. And I walk into their new Puerto Rican family kitchen. I'm like, oh my God, there it goes. Jesus is on the wall. <laughs> and there we go, the spider plant. That spider plant that's in every one of our kitchens. Spider plant and aloe. And little herbs and things that grandma used to keep. And then whatever island, country, or state your people came from, 
in that black velvet or crocheted or palm, pla you know, pla pla plaited palm, representing Puerto Rico, Grenada, Jamaica, Haiti, Alabama, North Carolina, all the, the same elements, the same smells. The, from, my, from my kitchen, from my grandmother's kitchen, it was this pot she keep in the back of the stove. And the pot contained all edible vegetable clippings. Just to make, was it a stock, was it a broth, was it a whatever? Was it pot liquor, I don't know. All I know is the reason why her food tasted so good is because every bit of onion, garlic, carrot, tomato, whatever she had that day went into that pot and that liquid went into everything. The greens, the soup, the sauce, the that. So if it was barbecue sauce, it wouldn't just be water. My grandmother's number one rule was don't cook with water. Are you crazy? <laughs> water has no flavor. Water, has, water is light but has no flavor. Cook with this, this enriched stock. And, it was, it was, it was, and if there was meat in it, great. If there wasn't meat in it, great. She called it wish meat broth. Mm. I wish there was a meat in it, but ain't none in it. <laughs> so that, I mean, that to me, the smell of, um, the smell of the smoked turkey and the onion and that, that the pot liquor smell, um, hot pepper, definitely. So my house smells like all of those things. You know, right down to the fact when you go in the kitchen, the first time I've ever had an adult kitchen, and I'm a middle-aged man, and it's like, um, I told you on the phone, it was like, there's the mezuzah, there's the hamsa, there's the, the kimiyot amulets. I am, I am that Sephardi Mizrahi dude with all the amulets around. I literally believe the devil's at the, every corner waiting to get me. And then, of course, also on that same wall is hung like a mezuzah is the hot comb that my, grand, my mom, my grandmother, and my great-grandmother used. Because it, went on, it was that Madam C.J. Walker hot comb that went on the stove, the, the, the gas stove, that you straighten your hair out with. And to me, it just reminds me of, the, of that maternal element. That, that, to me, that one corner where the mezuzah and the hot comb are both placed on the wall, I kissed them both. That's, that's their presence. I mean, I you know, the kitchen for us is where we pray, where we cook, we argue. It's where we eat. It's where we do our hair. But if you grew up black, I don't care what kind of black you grew up, the kitchen stove and that was your hair, was the hair salon of the house. You know, that was how we, that's how we did. It was where we danced. It's where we worried about the bills. And it's also where both blacks and Jews also confront the hatreds and prejudices of the outside world hmm. in that space. So when people read my book and they're like, why do you got to read about all this, these, these, these you know, anecdotes about uh, oppression? Where do you think they got resolved? The kitchen table. Hmm. Where do you think my grandmother told me to lift, keep my head up? The kitchen table. Where do you think I heard stories about immigration and survival? And among you know my Jewish family, the kitchen table. And I never forget Miss Claire. Uh, she's still around, living in uh, Jersey. Uh, she was the she's the um, the grandma of three kids I taught. I'm cooking with Miss Claire, and I loved it because she was so lovely, and she, her hands looked like my grandmother's arthritic hands. And I, ne I never watched the face; always the hands that I watch. And I said, she's cutting something, and I said, jicama. She's like, oh, we're going to try jicama. So we're making dinner for everybody, whole family. And I said, Miss Claire, tell me about your father. And she said, my father came from Poland. He went to England first. Then he went to Crown Heights. It was before it was Hasidic. And she said to me, she says, my father would, um, every Yom Kippur, pay the shtibl next door $10 and all they had to do was open up the window. So he would sit on, in his house with the window open and uh, pay them $10 to open up their window. He'd sit right beside the window with his talus and his, and his moxer and pray along with the synagogue across the, 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 this is several floors up, across the way in the middle of the air and do whatever they did at the same time. And I said to her, did your father ever really connect with people he left behind. She gave me this strange look and she says, no, you hug the people you loved, 
he said goodbye, and that was it. And I realized how caught I was in my own time, you know, Facebook, FaceTime, TikTok, Twitter. They didn't have none of that. So I passed it on to my students, starting with her grandchildren. And I went, do you know the courage it took to get on that boat in Hamburg? Had to go overland from Tsar the Tsarist Russia to Hamburg, maybe to London next, or Southampton, and cross the Atlantic Ocean, and know that she would never, ever, ever see these people ever again. And oftentimes you were a kid, you were not an adult. You were a teenager or you were a kid, and that was it. And to hear that story, that same story being told by um, Carlos and Rosalita, two Mexican Jews, both Orthodox, both grew up in Mexico City, and her, their, their niece is, has this beautiful red hair, and trying to tell people in California, I'm completely Mexican, I'm completely Jewish, in a very Catholic Mexican community. But, they told, but, but Carlos told a story that was, that was so deep. He said, one day, his grandfather was told by his grand, his grandfather was told by his grandfather, we're going to the synagogue. What for? He said, today is your bar mitzvah. But I haven't practiced a thing. He said, don't worry. He threw a talit on him. He said a bracha. And then 24 hours later, he was sent with a relative to get on the train to go to a boat. And he went to a place called Mexico, where he had some aunts and cousins waiting for him. He had to learn Spanish, which is very different from Yiddish. And he eventually learned how to love um, uh, what they call gribbinous taquitos mm -hmm. and mole sauce on Pesach. And that's how it worked. And, I just, and when I hear stories like that, and I talk about the Southern Jewish thing and the Caribbean Jewish thing, where you know, eventually recipes that really did begin in um, the African Atlantic tradition become synonymous with Jewish identity. Mm -hmm. no, no surprise there. It was the quick version of what happened over thousands of years in the Eastern Hemisphere. That's a great segue. We're going to um, shortly ask uh, the audience to prepare some questions if you have them and um, pass the mic around. But before we do, uh, that's a perfect segue to uh, an aspect of your book I'd love for us to share with the audience. Sure. Um, one thing that we haven't, we've, we've touched on, but maybe, um, you know, I just want the audience to know, in this book, Michael has conversations with a lot of really interesting fellow black Jews from different cultures, and I feel like that's a really important aspect of this mm -hmm. book as well. And there are chapters where you just ask, you know, your friends and your associates who are also both black and Jewish, what dishes they celebrate the holidays with and what they like the best. And I just, I don't know, I opened it to the page where we go into some of that. I would love for you to cherry pick some that, or just from your head, you don't have to read from your own book. But it, these are just such delightful menus and I, I would love mm. to share it with the audience. So one thing I've been asked is, is there a kosher soul tradition? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> Which is a very African Atlantic and Jewish answer, right? And it's because um, these things go ebb and flow. I didn't want to write a book and define Coach Yourself for everybody, all right? I wanted people to know that, you know, Rabbi Sandra Lawson, who is black, who is a veteran, who is openly gay and a reconstructionist rabbi, her vegan kitchen is not my kitchen. But we both practice some element of Coach Yourself. Kosher not only referring to the, strict, the strictly observing kashrut, but to Jewish foodways in general. Soul referring to the intangible element of our black identity as expressed through our food and material culture. So I'll just read this part since it's like nice and italicized <laughs> and easy to pick out. So it's about Shabbat. So um, here you go. Zebulun said, for Shabbat, red beans and rice with a turkey neck chicken soup, collard greens with smoked turkey, candy and sweet potatoes, cornbread dressing, potato salad, and pound cake. That's the Shabbos dinner. <laughs> Y'all like, wait a minute, hold up. Maybe I need to be black and Jewish. Koach, <laughs> who is also, Koach is special to me because Koach Frazier is a trans African-American 
man who is a rabbinical student. Times are changing, baby. <laughs> Guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> Fried chicken, sauteed Brussels sprouts, and challah. Um, Save challah and Jaradora Watt, spicy salmon, rice schnitzel, meatballs, salads, wine, and more. So you see the mixture. Ethiopian, southern, um, you know, Ashkenazi, um, Shays Rishon, my, my friend Manish Tana, who is black and Hasidic. And by the way, his mother and his grandparents, also black and Hasidic, his great grandparents, black and Orthodox, his great great grandparents, black and Orthodox. We just lost Rabbi Yezra Francis, who uh, Chase went to, Chase is, uh, and his siblings went to, went to school within, in Crown Heights. Rabbi Francis and his wife, both African American and Jew, Afro, well, more Afro Caribbean and Jewish. A Yikas going back 500 years each. Died a Chabad rabbi. So these are, these, this, is, this is just like people who think they know it. No, there's a, you know, Chase is like baked salmon, pasta with broccoli and mushrooms and olive and ground beef, orange glazed chicken, couscous or rice with curry. And then there's me, you know, got to have the matzo meal fried chicken on a very special Shabbat, got to have the West African brisket, got to have the jollof rice stuffed collard greens like stuffed cabbage, got to have, you know, one time I did Liz and Jeffrey's chillant, Hungarian chillant, because I'm not a chillant person, but I made it work. <laughs> Dathina, other things, and I love, I love stuffed vegetables, I, I like, you know, for the Bukharan tradition, I, I absolutely love Moroccan cigars, burekas, mina, I mean, I am, I'm, I'm a very, listen, schug, all that kind of good stuff. But also, there's fish, there's heirloom fish peppers made into hot sauce in my kitchen. There's the Caribbean hot sauce I make with rum. It all, it all gets played against each other. And I have fun with it. But I'm not, but I'm one of the rare few who actually mixes the traditions together um, and, and plays that game. I mean, I have no problem with South Carolina, well, the, my family, part of my family is from South Carolina. So South Carolina mustard sauce barbecued lamb, you know, awesome. But I also have no problem with making the most strictly Ashkenazi golden yolk you've ever seen in your life, the chicken soup. Mm. I get the chicken feet, I get the, the onion. The only thing I do different than everybody else, I still kind of sneak myself into it, is my grandmother, would, when she would do soup, um, she would take cloves and put them into the onion. Oh. So that's, that would, that, I always do that. And so, you know, pinch of turmeric, I'm good. Put the parsnips in there, the celery, the onion, the whole mirepoix, the turnip, the dill. You're making me so parsley. hungry. <laughs> but I mean, like, but I mean, it's funny because I also, but here's the fun part, we'll, we'll go move on to the next thing. Potato salad, that'll make or break somebody. <laughs> now there is black potato salad, and there's Jewish potato salad. Do y'all know, you know, know the difference? Jewish potato salad, dill, peas, carrots. Black potato salad must have garlic, paprika, bell pepper, mustard. So you try, I remember the first time I made my mom, blessed memory, Jewish potato salad, she was like, what is this? And then of course, my big joke is that I thought that a lakshin kugel, like the, like the good one, I make mine with, the, like, with frosted flakes, of course, is like, okay, that's the sweet version, but then you have the other, the other versions out there, and I'm like, wow, Jewish macaroni and cheese is so different. <laughs> like, what's going on here? What, 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 what are we doing? What, 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 where's, the, where's the government cheese? What's going on? Where's the paprika? So there is that. Last but not least, I should say this before we get on the questions. So when I was in Savannah many years ago, this is a really beautiful old synagogue. Mikveh Israel has the, the Western Hemisphere's, sorry, no, no, I'm right. The Western Hemisphere's oldest Torah scroll, like 600, 700 years old. Wow. Um, it was brought over by the Portuguese community to make it early Mikveh Israel, was Sephardic community. At any rate, I met this gentleman, he was a lawyer, he lived on the, one of the islands, 
And he said, you know, when I was growing up in Savannah, every week we had okra soup, red rice, fried chicken, challah that was like made out of biscuit dough. And he described this whole, this whole, this whole setup. And I was like, that's like Black Sunday, Low Country Sunday. He's like, exactly. Hmm. Two weeks later, I go to Portland, Maine. I meet this um, lady who had long moved from the South to, to Maine, had her, had her very deep Southern accent, also Jewish, also grew up in Israel, but did not know this other gentleman. You know that she described the exact same Shabbat menu. Say, for example, it was always potato salad, deviled eggs mm. on the table. So these people had already been sort of African-Americanized. Who was doing the cooking? Black women. There was that. Then you move on to my friend, Sean, who is from, Alabama, from Florida. He's from Florabama. <laughs> Those of us who are from the South know what I mean by that. And he, he talks about the food he misses, but I'm, I, never, I never met Southern, white Southern converts from Protestantism to not have this like, longing to make sure they kept the Southern food tradition, even though they were kosher and were Jewish. And then last but not least, Chava, my friend who's a lawyer, her husband is also black, also Jewish, Jamaican. So she, her husband's Jamaican, she's from Louisiana. So she has Creole Cajun, black Creole Cajun food in her house, Jamaican food, but also Ashkenazi and Sephardi food. Her community is Moroccan and Persian. Hmm. So now they have that in common. But also I interviewed um, uh, Chef Chambre, who is African-American and Muslim in Philadelphia. And when I, uh, coming from the South. But when you added up all, all the different stories and ingredients, we were all done with the same palate. Mm -hmm. The same idea of dietary laws, of course halal and kashrut are not the same, but very similar. Sure. So just, just talking to everybody, it was like, wow. And the funniest thing in the world was when Chef Chambre was talking about something with um, raisins or something and some carrot salad. And, she, and I said, oh my God, what, what are you doing? And she, her, her, Chef Chambre, this you know, practicing Muslim chef, she go, caterer, she goes, I'm sorry, that's way too goyish, isn't it? <laughs> she knew, she knew, she, the same language, the same language. And that her and Hava did not like rose water, a lot of rose water in the food. Mm -hmm. Even though they're religionists, use rose water as Pakistani, Indian, and Persian, and as Persian and Moroccan. Same, the same kind of things. I just say that to end this part of the conversation to say that we have so much in common, y'all. We are not all divided. We don't, our bubbles and our boxes do not matter. We really do have a common stomach, a common drive, and we need to respect that. You know, one of my favorite uh, adinkra symbols from Ghana is the crocodiles that share two stomachs. It's the beginning of the cooking gene, my first book. You know, it's, it's the idea that people can be very, very different, but still have the same path ahead of them. So, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Twitty. Yes, had you, sir. Had you gone to a formal cooking school at any point? Nope, my cooking school was mama, grandma, and daddy, and my uncles. Everybody cooked. Um, and then I remember one day I was, I was talking with Chef Matthew Rayford, who is, was actually been, uh, America has represented the salt to slow food, several um, conventions going in Italy. And I said, Matthew, should I, go to cooking? should I go to culinary school? He looked me dead in the face and he said, as a low country chef, who had gone to culinary school, he says, look, I'm gonna tell you what my grandmother told me. The only thing culinary school gave you was student debt and taught you in French what I taught you in black English. <laughs> so I've never really felt the need. Um, I, felt, I felt the desire to sort of go to someplace like France and do, my, my friend Mashama Bailey, who's a James Beard award-winning chef, she did that on her own after culinary school, just to learn things. To me, that's cool, it's fun, but it's not gonna change the grandma cooking that I do at home. And it wasn't just my grandma, it was when I was you know, at Magen David and I would be around these Moroccan and Algerian and Syrian women. And I didn't have to exchange a word with them, even though I did. 
and learning how to make mamu, and learning how to make kaak, and learning how to make um, mujedra, and um, um, tadik. You know, you, I knew, what, I knew what, the, what the deal was. You watch the hands. You watch the steps. You do the dishes, you take out the trash, and you go shopping with the people when you can. So you know exactly what to get, how to get it, how to pick the right herbs for sabzi. All of that, you know, those, those, those are things they can't teach you in culinary school. They can teach you how to make food for a restaurant, but not for a family. You know what I'm saying? So maybe, maybe one day I'll get there. Who knows? Who knows? Uh, question. We have some uh, That's questions a really good question. from our online audience. Sure. Uh, a controversial question. Is there a Jewish food or specifically an Ashkenazi food that you dislike or maybe even hate? Okay, Dr. Brown celery soda. <laughs> no, ma'am. I guess in some clubs you can be born in, others you, other you got to join in, but that's not for me. No, ma'am. Get filter fish, I have learned, just like chitlins. I've never eaten a chitlin in my life and never intend to. The reason why you eat chitlins is to eat hot sauce, as much hot sauce as you want. The reason why you get filter fish is to eat as much horse rice as you want. If you ate horse radish on its own, they'd say it's mashuga, lock him up. But, the, but we created a legal fiction called gefilte fish with those two little carrots on top and a sprinkle of parsley and a piece of celery and then said, ha ha, there you go. Now you can eat as much horse radish as you want. So yes, I can't, I can't stand that celery soda. I, also, by the way, beef tongue. Baby. Mm -mm, mm -mm, I don't, but it tastes like brisket. No, uh, 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 they call it awful for a reason. Awful, right? So yeah, that's that's the question. That's the answer. And the reverse, my favorite. Okay, so Megina is one of my favorite Sephardic foods. It's from my my rabbi's tradition from Rhodes and former to Turkey, Yugoslavia. It's the lamb and matzah kind of like lasagna that you make on Pesa. And of course, barekas, any kind of bareka. But on the Ashkenazi side, kasha varnishkas. Oh my God. You know, it, you know the, if you make it right with the, you cook the onions down, you make the gravy properly. And of course, you know, the seasoned salt of, of American Judaism is osum chicken consomme. <laughs> you all know what I'm, all know what I'm talking about. Uh, one version of the other next and everything like, people are like, what is that interesting taste you put in there? I ain't gonna tell you. If they're Jewish, they already know. If they're not Jewish, they don't know. And they, that little red cap, yellow vat of like synthetic, oh my God, Jeffrey, I'm so ashamed. You know, chicken stock, but my God, is it good. This is, but of course, you know, you, you, as you get up in age and the sodium has to come down, you use less and less and less and less, but you make it work. Um, here's one more, which, uh I love since I survive on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, what Jewish soul food, and then what soul food would you recommend for a first time Ashkenazi? First time Ashkenazi. Oh, goodness. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> to challenge yourself, because I have done this, Picha. <laughs> so I heard that. I heard that. Those of you who don't know what pacha is, pacha is an excuse to eat garlic. That's all it is. It's the calf's foot boiled to, to get the gelatin out of it. Mm-hmm. It's a food that twerks. You know, call my girl up Lizzie with her crystal flute and start eating. You know, um, African-American collard greens. And I have a whole chapter about collard greens. We won't go into the story, but you have to read the book for that. But I mean, um, your kosher roll is with collard greens. Yeah, the kosher soul roll is with collard greens. That's what I made for Andrew Zimmern when I was on Bizarre Foods the first time. Can you tell us really quick what that so, is? Yeah, it's it's an it's a spring roll, not an egg roll, spring roll, made with collard greens and pastrami. Yeah, I know, right? And the first time that Andrew Zimmern had it, I made enough for the entire crew. He ate all of them. <laughs> to this day, I'm like, Andrew, you realize that was for like the whole crew and you. He was like, I don't care. <laughs> all right, so is, uh, before I ask this, we'll, we'll end on, on a question from here then. Right 
what was your inspiration to write this book or to find your way to Judaism? Okay, so the inspiration is to just basically tell people, create a blueprint, and tell people we exist. And that we have everyday Jewish lives. You know, in light of certain recent controversies, you know, we do the same thing everybody else does. I have a Netalashi Dayim cup. It's the first moment of my day. That and my dog, my blind dog going, get up, get up, I gotta pee. Um, it's um, wishing people a mazel tov when life is good, down Amos when life isn't. You know, we, all, we have very common Jewish, everyday Jewish lives. And then, of course, the other part of me is the kippah with James Baldwin and Audre Lorde and Zora Neale Hurston and Jackie Robinson. It's the Shabbos cover, Shabbat Brett Hala cover from Ghana. It's the Ethiopian Talit. It's the African American state of play. It's the ways in which, you know, I curate and decorate my life in such a way to tell the story about who I am. And also the food. You know, the whole job of the food is to make people shut up. You know, put the food in your mouth, start chewing. You know, African, there's one of the most beautiful West African proverbs is, if you sit down with me and eat my food, you'll know who I am. So that's important to me. Um, you know, the other part is kind of complicated because here I am, I had to have a certain way into Jewish practice. But then when I did the cooking gene and did my DNA, and I find out, oh yeah, just so you know, 23 Me tells you, you've got 20 plus cousins from the area around Russia and Ukraine, and all four of their grandparents are Jewish. It doesn't surprise, and, 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 it, and by that time, everything had already happened to the point where I was like, I was legit. Did I really feel that I needed that? And then, then there was another part of me that went, but you always knew. You heard stories in your family. You always knew. And you always knew, and you had this certain feeling inside of you. I used to tell my students, I taught Hebrew school for 15 years. I used to tell my students, one day I'm gonna to go to Ukraine. Well, not now, but I go to Ukraine and pray at the grave of the Baal Shem Tov. I'm like, we well, don't even wanna do that. Why do you wanna do that, right? And I said, I can't explain it to you. All I know is I have to go there and I have to pray. And then to find that out, it's just like, by that time it was like yet again, the ancestors are like, come on, come on. It's not just the ones you expect. When I was in Ireland, I felt weird. I felt extremely weird. Because I knew that before all that racism, white supremacy, and other nonsense happened, a good portion of my DNA was in Ireland and England and Wales. And so I was literally walking around going in this very insular island I've got to have passed a cousin at least several times as I went through Dublin. And I kept wondering, which one of these people is my people? And what would they say if that we knew that we were related? So when I went to West Africa, I would meet people, and it was just a stunning feeling to look at somebody who I was separated from by the slave trade and go, oh my God. One of them, and I'll end on this note, on this, to this question, my cousin Oliver grew up from Liberia, grew up in, um, and not, not a miracle Liberian, by the way, Manding and crew. Grew up about two hours away from me. He came here when he was seven years old. He's a little bit younger than me. He's also a chef. We have the same gap, the same forehead, the same eyes. And we met a couple years ago, and it was bizarre. It was like, you're a chef, I'm a chef. The only thing that's separating us was a slave ship. And at that point, I just realized you could be around a family at any point in time and not know it. And that's why we should love each other. We don't have an excuse. We don't have an excuse at all. Because we don't, we, it's one thing to love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, Baruch Hashem, you should love yourself. You should love your neighbor. But you should also know that at any, any given point in time, that person you want to cuss out, or fight with could be your blood. And that blood could be Arab, that blood could be Jewish, that blood could be Persian, that blood could be British, that blood could be African, that blood could be Chinese. But it's still, still family. 
And if I, if, and if, and if I learn nothing else on this planet, I'm grateful I learned that. A beautiful note to end this evening on. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so Thank you. much. Awesome. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Chef Michael Twitty. And thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you back soon. Thank you. Thank you.